Welcome back to the Allianz Capital Markets Day 2021. We will now have our Q&A session. If you want to ask a question, here is how you raise your virtual hand. If you are joining us via web call, please click on the Talk Request button in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. If you are joining us via telephone, please press star 5. Finally, please keep in mind that this conference, including your contribution, is being streamed live on Allianz.com and YouTube, and a recording will be made available shortly after the event. All right, that's all from my side for now, and we will now take your questions. And we will take the first question from Peter Elliott, Kepler Chevreau. Peter, please go ahead. Peter Elliott, Kepler Chevreau. Peter, please go ahead. Uh, thank, thank you very much indeed, uh, Oliver, and uh, <coughs> thank you for the presentations and uh, the good news yesterday evening and, and this morning. Um, if I could ask three questions, please. Um, I guess if I've understood correctly, you've still got nearly six billion backing the US business. I mean, I'm probably being greedy here after the update, but I'm just wondering, you know, is, is the scope to do even more in, in the future? Um, and secondly, I'm, I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit uh, more generally about the back book uh, market. Appreciate this is a reinsurance deal, but you know, um, there's also seems to be a lot more sellers. I mean, you said private capital now is more available than before. Um, I'm just wondering if that's sort of being driven partly by the healthier market. Yeah, maybe, maybe you could talk a little bit about that, it'd be great. Um, and finally, um, you mentioned that the 40 basis points uh, yield uplift at Allianz Leben. I guess most of that is coming from private equity. Um, I'm just wondering if you could uh, sort of mention to what extent you, you feel there's additional risk involved there and, and how manageable that is. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Peter, Oliver yeah, Bete uh, here, yeah. let me address your uh, first two questions and then I hand over to Andreas for the question on Allianz Leben because he's perfectly suited to address that. So indeed, um, what we have announced this morning is not a deal, Peter. It is the beginning of a transformation of not just the AZ Live business model to an asset light, an asset gathering model, but we'll continue to look at opportunities. As I said earlier, we have a VA block that we're looking at. We're looking at other parts to enhance capital efficiency, even maybe with new products that we're currently not selling because they are so capital consumptive. So it's a shift in strategy, not a transaction and that's very important second yes we're looking at it beyond the us please as a reminder our partners particularly resolution we've already done the first swiss transaction from switzerland directly to bermuda ever five billion that is going to move switzerland's roe in life you know think about that 13 percent and above so it's a part of what we are trying to do so yes the answer is there is no more room and yes, now we look at it in terms of value. If, if there are offers like we have a frenzy at the moment, then we will crystallize it if the, the value creation opportunities are not better than what we can do ourselves. The second one, Peter, that is very important, why it's a partnership and not a deal, because we want to work with partners that supplement their capabilities with ours, and particularly growing the asset management side. Many Romans said that earlier, the idea is really, really to not just reduce capital consumption, and bring up ROE in AZ Life, but also bring more business to our outstanding asset managers and bring and grow their private capital capabilities and the whole old space. So it is, has double synergies in that respect. So this is not about taking capital out and redistributing it. We want to use it to uh, grow the business, in particular in a, in a capital efficient way. And we're gonna do that systematic. But again, the US, Peter, is um, what has been very much pronounced because there have been many transactions. The market is very efficient. There is strong competition. So it's very clear where the value is and how do we partner to capture it. In other markets, like in Europe, it's not yet that developed. There's more a sale a sell market rather than a reinsurance market for many, many reasons. Now, another thing I wanted to say is we spend a lot of time preparing this, actually almost two years, because the risk management component of this interaction is super important. In difference to other shorter uh, opportunistic deals, we've established a risk management framework that makes sure even under severe uh, shocks, 
both parties do understand what is going to happen, what is the collateral going to look like, how does capitalization look like. So we want to build something that survives shocks and can survive shocks rather than that is opportunistic. Now, with that, I hand over to Andreas. Yeah, thank you for the question, Peter. I think uh, if you look at the asset classes, really all of them mentioned are really contributing to this uplift. So besides, yes, private equity is important, but also private debt. Uh, and uh, real estate is, is also a big part of this uh, uplift. Now, the volatility, and that's why we like alternative assets so much, it's really limited here. I mean, uh, that's the nice thing about the accounting principle here. And Allianz Leben, as a really long-term investor, can uh, have these asset classes very, very well. So I would even say that alternative, is, alternative assets help to reduce the volatility when it comes to our investment returns. Yeah, and maybe Peter, just to add, uh, even though Andreas said it all, what is very important, the, the reason why we and others cannot do this is threefold. The first is access to investment opportunity. We've been growing the old space for more than a decade. The second one is we get a higher margin. Yes, you can call an investment bank and say, I also want to have real estate assets, but you're paying a lot of the value now on the acquisition side. We do that together with our asset managers so we don't have to overpay in generating the assets and we get a higher quality. But the third one is super important. Allianz Leben has, depending on how you run the numbers, two or three times the buffers in its balance sheet. So it's not just a matter of what the absolute resilience is, but also relative to others. We are much more resilient and much more efficient because we've built the policyholder reserves to a level that we are a lot more shock resistance than we really show. So when Andreas showed the Solvency II numbers, these are before transitionals. If you look at uh, the transitionals, which are hard capital in a stress scenario, we're north of 300, I don't know what gazillion percent. So really comfortable to be able to withstand shocks that others cannot manage. And maybe at, at just one point from the product view, you, you, you will uh, know that we already have launched a product it's called Private Finance Police, where you can directly invest in these um, alternative asset classes. And uh, we have seen that since 2020, one billion have been invested in this, with no guarantees, but also seeing that this is providing stability to these, uh, let's say, wealthy investors. I hope that answers your question, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. We will take our next question from Andrew, Andrew Ritchie. Andrew, your line should be open now. <coughs> Go ahead. Sorry, I, sorry I, my mistake is I clicked on the wrong button. Give it a try again, Andrew. Now you should, your line should be open. There we are. Hello, can you, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Hi, a um, couple of questions. Um, first of all, Oliver, um, in the last uh, sort of planning cycle, you, you spent roughly the same amount on buybacks as on bolt-on M&A, roughly. Is that a good rule of thumb? I guess, I guess I'm surprised, I'd be surprised if it was, given uh, the, the risk is if you keep doing more buybacks, that, that adds complexity. And you've told us today at length, um, impressively, about the group's in-house capabilities. Uh, so, so I guess that's the first question. Second question, a short one. Um, th there's an uplift um, in asset management um, fees from the US deal, which, which I think implies that the asset management business wasn't getting commercial terms pre the deal. So is there, is there some kind of uplift to a shift to commercial terms because uh, what was an in-house client becomes an external client? Um, the third question is for um, for Pimco. Um, I'm just curious to understand. I think I think what you're telling us is you're very happy with your existing alternatives capability. There's been a lot of your competitors um, aggressively buying alternatives, particularly private equity capability. Is that that's something I, I think you're saying you don't you feel you've got it in house? Um, linked to the expected growth in alternatives and private. Do you then expect the overall fee margin for PIMCO to be higher in 2024 uh, than today? Thanks. 
Okay, as usual, Andrew, thank you for your smart questions. Let me start out uh, with the first component. It's very hard to make a prediction on exactly the mix between acquisition, share buyback, or other capital measures. I want to reiterate the foundation is the growing dividend because that is what investors can rely on. And in difference to the past, we want to make sure people understand our confidence is so strong that we cannot just keep the last year, but we raise it every year 5% regardless. Whether that means uh, in, a, in a flat year, raising payouts, or in another year, that's, that's the minimum. That's one. And, and that's much stronger than it was three years ago because we have now a lot more control, we believe, around our own ability to generate cash and value. The second one is, uh, to your point on, on M&A, it's very lumpy. Remember, uh, initially we didn't do much. We sold Korea. Uh, we really helped to stabilize with Manny's arrival to stabilize PIMCO. You know, when I became CEO, we had 15 billion a week in terms of outflows. So it depends on where you are in the cycle. We will do whatever maximizes value for our shareholders. As you know, we have very, very hard criteria for M&A. Julio is making sure that we don't really waste our money. Sometimes it's hard to explain something because people look at value, you know, uh, price to NAV. We think that's wrong. We need to really look at price to earnings that we are paying and relative to the synergies. Think about Poland and building the scan. So the answer is, yes, we want to have a balanced approach, but at any point in time, it can be lumpy. As long as our share price or share is the best investments, we obviously prefer that and to invest in our own share. And we're going to do that as long as that makes sense. Over the long run, we want, as we said, to grow the company more. I think if you do excessive share buybacks, what we are basically doing is putting the company mentally and then capitalizing into runoff. So we need to get the balance right between maximizing return on investor capital and that we don't need to send that back. But if we can invest in profitable growth, we really believe we should do that and we have been doing it. It will not be with transformation and deals. That I would like to reiterate, same story 2015 as 18. A lot of money is wasted in very large transactions, so we are, we are focusing on systematically building the franchise, whether that is in PNC, that's been in life, or in asset management. And uh, I'll hand over to many now, but it's not like we are not looking at investments. In this current uh, frenzy that people are, are seeing, we haven't found a transaction yet that would fulfill our return criteria. But I think uh, Manny is the better person to talk to. Uh, Andrew, thank you for your question. Let me, let me just give you the framework. So right in the U.S. at 142 when I left my desk this morning, and most of our clients, whether the public fund or whether the insurance company, need to deliver returns above 7%. So the bottom line is they do need private solution to be able to deliver the returns that the stakeholders want. And so there is a big opportunity in private credit for both pension plan and for insurance company to actually purchase long lockup structure. And as you correctly pointed out, the margins on this product are higher. Obviously, performance is all what matter. And so if we perform, they will come. And if we don't perform, they won't come. Every time PIMCO look at the market, we have two options. Option one, do it in house and hire people. Option two, buy from the outside and try to do an add-on transaction. What I can promise you is every single transaction we have looked at from outside alternative manager makes no sense from a shareholder standpoint. And I think we've came pretty quickly to the conclusion that we're much better off hiring people and building in-house our capabilities and growing a business accordingly. Yeah, thank you, Manny. I uh, missed a question, Andrew, on the question of um, fees and mar at market or not. I think the, this is the quick solution if you look at it superficially, sorry to say, but the point is we are also having different asset mandates. So consistent with what we just heard from Manny, the new asset allocation will be more focused on alternatives on more sophisticated products. So we always use market benchmarks to say, you know, if you are replicating an index, that's the fee 
that we would get from anybody. And you know, PIMCO, like everybody else, is held to the same accountability as others. But as we all uh, add more value, as we move into more of the alternative space, as we create higher risk-adjusted returns, also the fees paid out of our life funds to PIMCO and others will go up for the right reason, because they're adding more value and they're creating more risk-adjusted returns. So the good answer is over the long period, not just for uh, in the Telcord resolution partnership, but across the universe, as we are scoping out and building out alternatives, the fee income for our asset managers, because we can outperform for our policyholders as much as we can for our shareholders, will go up. So the earnings power in asset management will be more stable and much higher. OK, great. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Andrew. We will take the next question from Vinit Malhotra. Vinit, please go ahead. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me, please? Could you speak up a little bit, Vinit, please? Thank you. Okay, can you hear me now? Is that better? Yes. Hello? Yeah, that's better. Okay, that's better. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> uh, my first question is on, uh, so I have three questions, please. Uh, life, PIMCO, and PNC. On life, uh, really, the, the question is uh, two, two questions, if I can. One is that the bank assurance uh, framework that I keep hearing about in the regulation of the banking world. Um, <clears throat> seems to have made it more attractive for banks to get involved and compete with insurance companies. Um, Oliver, what do you think? Is it a real risk or is it that you expect the banks to think of the partnerships that you think they should think of? So just just want to understand a little yeah. bit of that topic. Uh, then on the live side, I would I just wanted to ask, Andreas, if, you know, just before COVID hit, there was some focus in the market, and now I'm going back to N19, about new perspective of products which would be needed to, you know, push the, the company further on in this uh, exceptional delivery mode. Uh, is there some, is that, is that just suspended conversations? That's just, so, so that's a life topic. Uh, Pimco, uh, just for manning the slide 20, 122, please. Um, it's, <coughs> I seem to think that there's a lot of Allianz real estate coming in here, which might have uh, helped this slide to look like it is. I mean, could you help us understand that minus that effect, and if that effect is there, then minus that effect, how much has been really the underlying sort of push in alternative assets? And, and last question, please, for uh, this on commercial, the mid-corp, which is one of the important topics in your slideshow uh, is quite a popular area, isn't it? I mean, we've heard one of your competitors uh, a few weeks ago also talk about Midcorp, and I've heard several other insurers talk about Midcorp. Uh, I mean, how how are we going to differentiate, or is it they're looking at different lines, or uh, some some comment on competition in Midcorp, please? Thanks very much. Yeah, Vinit, I, I'll start with the first question that you asked. Uh, I call it the French banking wet dream, which is that it's <laughs> called the, the perpetuation of the Danish compromise, which has been proposed um, in the background to be perpetuated. By the way, it will be decided in a year and a half, right? So I'm surprised, <laughs> including from your bank, to see that now everybody has a strategy to do that. Now, let me explain for the broader audience what it means. It basically means double leveraging capital, which is defrauding policyholders, particularly in the French market, by double leveraging capital from the bank and insurance. Now, since the banks have 60, 70 percent of the market, it actually pertains to only two big ones. Um, and now the idea is to export that into other countries. We have a little bit in Italy with one large bank that does it too, but by and large is a phenomenon. Now, our industry, by the way, also our policymaker will do, uh, make sure that none of that happens because it basically means that the banks that are showing 14 or 12 percent core tier one capital ratios actually have about 10 or 7 billion less capital than they claim they have. Can you really believe that the ECB, the strategic European Strategic Risk Board, our regulators will allow people to deprive policyholders of better protection, by the way, just after they moved 
the corporate pensions from Solvency II back to Solvency I, which means half of the capital, I can't believe that. So uh, good luck with that assumption, and good luck for people that are building a strategy on double leverage and capital arbitrage. I have, in my life, never seen that prevail, but it may happen, and then we'll deal with that if needed in the courts, and I'm serious. The second one uh, that your question is pertaining to is very important on the product side, and I hope I understood the question because it was not very, very clear. We have already moved almost all of our new business into the target product. What you see as recurring premium uh, really from older products that is still in old products. So new business in anything that is not target is very quickly evaporating. And we are on the back book, as you saw, deploying a plethora of uh, uh, levers, whether that is selling books, reinsuring book, renegotiating, or actually redeploying uh, Infos business by talking to the distributors and clients and moving them from one product generation into another one. The reason why we do this strategically the way we do that, because we don't have a problem like others have that have to sell at a loss. By the way, we had one in Korea, but we fixed that five years ago. We have made promises to people, and we're not going to go and say, now we sell you to somebody else unless we absolutely have to. And the only place where we had to was in Korea. So it's very important to maintain the customer trust, to maintain the tr uh, trust of the regulators while we're moving into a capitalized product. And by the way, the way we measure our success is not just ROE, but net crediting rates and benefits to policyholders. It's very important, and we're going to talk about that some more in the future. The reason why we're going to be successful is not just we drive the NPS, but comparative crediting rates. So when you go to Germany or Italy, Allianz not just offers the best returns for shareholders, but also the best value to policyholders. Only when that happens, then you can win and you can grow market share. Now, with that, I hand over to Chris on the commercial lines. Sure. So the, the question around mid-core, um, I think I tried to touch on this on the slide earlier on. The competitive advantage we've got is around our brand, it's around our distribution reach, and it's obviously around our global platforms as well. So brand sort of speaks for itself. Distribution, the differentiator for us on distribution is our agency force. So our business is about 50-50 between broker and agency force. A number of our competitors don't have the quality of agency force we've got in Europe, which really helps our business. Then the third piece in terms of the, the global um, IT platform, um, don't think about that as purely IT, but think about it, please, in terms of the cloud-based pricing, portfolio management, and risk assessment tools, which we can bring to bear very quickly in every, every market. So that technical excellence will help us to drive down the loss ratio overall, and it's for that reason that we believe we'll be successful in that market. Yeah. Let, me, uh, let me answer the question on real estate. So there are three buckets. Bucket okay, number one, opportunistic real estate where the target return is 15 to 20%. If you do a quick search on PIMCO, you'll see that we recently taken private a REIT called Columbia. This segment of the market we've been doing for the past 15 years, we have private fund with long lockup where we try to deliver those returns. I think we're quite active and we had a pre-existing team. The second bucket is prime and core real estate. Oliver and I had talked quite a bit about where we should house the ARE business. We talked with Gunter and we decided because of the synergy that you can make a very strong case for shareholder that the Alliance real estate business should be housed in PIMCO where we can expand our capability and especially have synergy with the third bucket which is the real estate lending business. This is something we've done for quite a long time. We are a fixed income house. We think we understand the risk in real estate lending quite well. It's quite a big market in the US. We have dedicated private fund doing just that. We thought that having a better and bigger footprint in core real estate would enhance our capability to be able to expand this business and we have. And so when you look at our offering, it's of course work in progress, but it's incredibly strategic for us for the next five years and I think quite exciting. Great, thanks very much everybody, thank you. Thank you, Vinit. Okay, we will 
take the next question from William Hawkins. Will, go ahead, please. Hello, Will, go ahead. Hey, you can hear me, can you? Yeah. Yes. Thank we, you. We can also um, see you. First, uh, slide 73, when you talk about your IT budget. Uh, oh, sorry, I've got feedback. Um, I'll try and get out of the way. Um, slide 73, you've got the 4.2 billion IT budget, which is split 40-60. That's been quite constant for a while. And I'm thinking when you look out to the end of this business plan or the end of 2030, are there going to be any material changes? And I suppose the question, Oliver, really is, I appreciate the importance of the profit guidance that you're sticking with, but you could take a small hit to profits substantially to accelerate your investment in the change process. And I'm kind of wondering, you know, why you don't think more about investing more aggressively in the change part of the IT budget. Um, secondly, could you just be clear again on your definition of excess capital? You're very clear that you will repatriate excess capital, but it's quite hard to think about how we quantify that statement. And as a small detail, why have you decreased, why have you decreased the floor for Solvency 2 to 150 from 160 percent? It feels to me like an, an unnecessary detail given how comfortably capitalized you are. And then lastly, please, um, with regards to this current planning cycle, have you examined whether the asset management business should run with more risk capital than the $1 billion that's currently allocated? And I apologize for the stinted nature of those questions. No, it's very good. We can hear you loud and clearly. Thank you very much. So Barbara can spend probably uh, some time on it, but I'll do it quickly in the interest of time. Um, this is a little bit like drinking good wine. If you drink too much of good wine, you get a headache. So we believe in technology. We're spending a lot of money, and it's exactly right what you have said. We need to spend more money on change and less on run. So what Barbara has described is we need to move the budget from maintaining legacy platforms into creating competitive advantage front to back, both in customer-facing technology in the intermediate layer and then in the backend systems if and when that is right. So you, you've outlined it. And the only way it works is we need to retire and decommission old business models, old products, processes, and with them, old applications. And we have a very ambitious decommissioning plan to shift the balance. Can we do better? Absolutely, we can still do a lot better on this one. With that, I hand over to Julio for some of the questions on how the numbers work. Well, thank you, William. So starting from the question regarding asset management and allocation capital to asset management, no, we are not going to physically allocate more capital to asset management. And by the way, there are clear requirements of capital for asset management, so we're going to stick to the requirements. Now, if you ask me to think more complicated, I tell you, at the end of the day, we are holding 40 billion of SCR in total, so it's a big number, and uh, we, I don't, I, I don't, it doesn't look like we have a problem with 40 billion of SCR, where we also keep a ratio on top to, to have enough capital for sustaining uh, all kind of risk that we might have. So, but the answer is clearly we're not going to allocate physical capital uh, to asset management uh, because of what we're going uh, through. On the excess capital definition, I would say that 180% uh, is our uh, uh, solvency ratio, where we say that's the, the target level. So fundamentally, you could say all the capital on top of that is excess capital, but then clearly you have also other parameters that you need to consider. For the sake of what we presented today, we are just talking about the change in the excess capital. So when we speak about the 12 billion, that's the change in the excess capital. So that's what you need to uh, keep in mind. And then you had another question, the 160 versus the 150. Look, that's a little bit body language in the sense of we are ne really not concerned about the volatility of solvency too, right? And the point is sometimes, and we saw that also during the COVID, people get very scared because the solvency ratio is moving up and down. And I would say we should not be scared about the volatility of solvency too. I tell you something, as we start the meeting, 
and we go and we finish the meeting, the solvency ratio might move, might move by a couple of percentage points because rates can move up and down sometimes by 10 basis points. And our <coughs> message is we shouldn't be scared by some volatility of solvency to ratio. That's what we can tell you from our side. We are comfortable with the volatility and we hope that you're going to get comfortable with some volatility uh, too. So that's more a body language to say, uh, you know, that's part of the equation, but we have enough uh, capital liquidity to sustain this uh, volatility. Okay, thanks, Will. Thank you, William. Then we had a question on the IT budget. I did that. You did that, okay. Yeah. Thought also, okay. Okay, very good. Then we will take the next question from Dominic O'Mahony from um, Exan BNP Paribas. Dominic, your line should be open. Hello, everybody, and thank you for taking our questions. Um, just two, really, from me, um, both in the context of, of, of the broader point that you're making about shifting the business um, towards capital, like both organically and through these strategic partnerships. Um, the, the first is, is really just on the ROE targets. Um, if I put together the, the, um, the beginning of the, the strategic partnerships that you've, you've laid out, um, the, the organic shift to capital light, as well as the, the margin expansion in your uh, growth targets, I might have thought that actually that would be positive for ROE and that you might be able to afford to set a, a, an ROE target above that 13%. Um, is this just you being conservative? Am I, am I going in the right direction or are there other factors in the, in the equation that we need to think about that might... Um, that, that might, I might not be taking into account. Um, and then the second question is, um, one point that's been put to me by investors is, while, while the broad shift to capital light is, is to be welcomed, there is a risk that this also erodes um, margins. And, and actually there, the, the big question is, do the insurers have powerful distribution capabilities to, to protect that? Um, Chris, you mentioned um, the advantage in agency distribution um, in commercial in Europe, um, which um, is very clear, and thank you for explaining that. I wonder if you could explain, um, maybe for some of the other markets, other product lines, where you see uh, your distribution advantages, uh, and indeed how you're dealing with some of the disruptions that you see in the market, you know, for instance, the, the, uh, the increased share um, captured by aggregators. Thank you. Maybe I can start with the ROE uh, question, so on the 13% the plus. You know, as I said before, the idea is to have a very robust 13% uh, plus. Now, clearly, the question you're posing is, can we go to 14? That's something that we, we are clearly going to, to have as, as a sort of uh, ambition. But I, I want also to tell you something. Let's say the life business where we are at 12% ROE and we know that the transaction that we did, uh, we announced today, is going to give us about uh, one percentage point of ROE. So you can say you're already 13%. But I can also tell you we did the Aviva transaction and the Aviva transaction clearly at the beginning is going to be a little bit dilutive on ROE. But that's what I like to say, uh, we are building also for the capital market day of 2024 to 2027. So you need to put together, you know, all the uh, elements. And clearly, if you are just focused on uh, lifting the ROE as much as you can in the next three years, you can get to 14% very, very easily. But as you think also about really building up a franchise and so on, there are clearly steps that you need to do in between that can detract a little bit from the ROE. And I like to think sometimes in EVA. When I joined Allianz, you know there was this concept of EVA. So at the end of the day, if you achieve a 13, robust 13% ROE on a, on, a, on a bigger basis, sometimes can be better than every 15 on a very, very light basis. But the answer to your question is, sure, we are positive. We're going to work on bad boost. They're going to add. But uh, the Aviva transaction, for example, is uh, something that is uh, impacting our ROE for the next three years by about 50 basis points. But then clearly, as we go down the road, you're going to see an ROE lift coming eventually also from that transaction. And the other question was on distribution, I understand. I was not sure about the question, so I think it was about distribution, whether where we have a distribution advantage on the life side. But I, I'm not sure I got the question properly. But. The, sure, the question is, um, so Chris talked about the, the advantage that you have in um, commercial uh, distribution in PNC uh, in continental Europe. I was wondering if you could comment on some of the other 
um, products and markets where you see your advantage when it comes to, to distribution. Yeah, Dominic, I think you, um, it's, it's Chris Townsend here. So you touched on it in relation to the mid-core business and then you, you reference aggregators. Obviously, you know, aggregators in the commercial business are not really a factor. They're, you know, the concept of a man and a van right at the bottom end of the SME market is starting to, to play out in some of the direct and aggregated business, but nothing more, um, more sophisticated than that. So from an aggregated market, we're, we're well placed in the markets that matter. For instance, the UK, we've got a very strong proposition in, in the LV business, uh, which is a super strong business in the UK. Uh, we've just launched a new capability actually on the aggregators in the UK to, to take account of the changes which are coming with the FCA review on the 1st of January there to make sure we can protect that business as well as our direct business. business. But we're not seeing it um, on a broader basis across the commercial business. Okay, Dominic, is that all? Or did we miss something? That, no, that's very helpful. I just wondered whether in other product lines, for instance, um, you know, in, in life, for instance, where Clearly, you know, the agency force, as I understand it, is very strong in, in, in your core markets. Any, any comments or colour on those would be helpful. Well, I think in general, the distribution power of Allianz and Life is, is extremely strong. It's, it's, uh, if you, as, as you have seen in the US, it's, it's really fantastic this year. I think in Germany, we have really made a huge swift from traditional products, as mentioned, to Capital Light, uh, which helps us to fuel uh, the growth also for our asset managers. Uh, we, we, we can grow um, much more efficient uh, and also our agents in Germany are working extremely well in life and asset management this year. Um, and I see the same in, in other countries. So I would say we are very, very well positioned, for instance, take Italy, uh, when it comes to the life distribution. Actually, I think that is one of our really strong assets as Allianz Group to having this distribution power. Yeah, very well, Benis. We always tend to forget Asia because we sit here in the core of Germany. When you look at the new business value growth in Asia, it's been one of the strongest that you've seen even amongst peers. So while the inflows look stronger, if you look at new business market shares, we're now the market leader in Indonesia. We're overtaking many competitors. So that is one thing in addition. And the vast majority of that is coming, again, like in Europe, through a diversified set of distribution channels, very, very strong agency distribution. We're working very much with focused regional banks where we have complementary skills and we're building out other capabilities as well. So we don't really rely on any of those. Even in Germany now, the brokers are the more relevant sales channels in terms of value than are our agents. And very few people do understand that. That's very helpful, thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Next one. We have about eight minutes to go. Yep. Um, we, will take, we will take our next question from Michael Hartner from Berenberg. Please go ahead, Michael. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, thanks for a lovely presentation. Um, I have two questions. One is the elephant in the room. I think you, you mentioned the word, and I thought, well, that's a nice introduction. And I just wondered if you, if you can actually speak a little bit, because the, the impression I have is that... Um, the topic which occupies, I think, a lot of investors' minds is, is so small for you that you, you, you kind of, it's almost like it doesn't feature in the three-year plan. So I just wondered if you can speak about that. The second question is on the, um, is for Julio. Last time in, in life, you promised 3% uh, growth. You achieved 6 This time you again was promising 3%. I just wonder why you love 3% rather than 6 um, It seems to me that you can easily beat it. You, you mentioned the uh, Aviva uh, 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 plan. And, and stuff. So I just wondered why is there this, this kind of reluctance, maybe? Um, and then the, um, the final question is, uh, is, is um, a little bit, a tiny bit. Um, uh, you ask us to adjust for natural catastrophes, you know, as a, as a finishing point or starting point. Um, I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about that, because I always worry, you know, if insurers grow in commercial lines, you obviously grow your. Uh, exposure to more volatile business. And I just wondered if, if that's something that might put some investors off. I, I just wonder if you can give us a little bit more comfort on that. Thank you. Maybe I can pay this question. So from the, the first question, I really tell you, you know, I'm very forthcoming, but there is not much I can say on the, on the first question. So we go straight to the second question, which I was expecting. Why 3% on the life side and not more? 
And, uh, you know, uh, that's the point. We are also doing backbone transactions. So from that point of view, these backbone transactions are taking away some profit. I can just tell you the backbone transaction that we, we did in uh, Switzerland, 20 million of operating profit. The backbone transaction that's uh, is very small, small in uh, France is only five. But, you know, when you add up, at the end of the day, it's going to detract a little bit from... Uh, from growth, but on the other side, you see the ROE going up. And maybe then we're going to surprise you on the upside, but think about is an ROE play, not just an operating profit uh, play. And then on the last one, on the normalization net cat, your point is very valid. So we feel good about normalizing 2021 for the net cat level, because we think it's really excessive compared to what we should expect. This said, we are very careful about this point, and as we think about our planning for 2024, we have a little bit more of an allowance for net cats. So from that point of view, we are not just saying everything is perfect and let's forget about net cats. We think it's fair at this point in time, as we present your number, the numbers for 2021 to make an, a normalization in order that you can see the progress uh, over time. But clearly, as we think about the future, we are clearly going to monitor the situation very carefully. We have a little bit of a high allowance for uh, NetCat, and as Chris said before, anyway, our program is, uh, is, pretty, is pretty strong. So from that point of view, well, I think we are uh, describing the situation in a fair way regarding the current performance, and we are very careful as we move forward into the next three years. Can you give a figure on the budget for that cat? You know, at the end of the day, uh, we are lifting, lifting it up by 20, 30 basis point, which doesn't look like a big number, but it's, you know, it's, it's a move, and then we're going to uh, monitor the situation as we, we, we get more uh, experience in, in 2022 and beyond. And also, i just add that the, um, the, the commercial growth we've spoken about is not intended to significantly increase the NatCat exposure, so it's in low NatCat um, areas of the business. Michael, by the way, the issue has not been in the past. NatCat, if I may just add finally, because you addressed the question, has been large losses in property, <coughs> which across Europe has been underperforming, also in terms of rate relative to technical requirements and we're systematically continuously clean the portfolios mostly by the way broker distribution so it's our own fault yeah so it's about discipline and as uh, chris has said we also re-emphasize tail risk management i.e having proper limits aggregates and reinsurance protection so it's all about being uh, disciplined not about being lucky fantastic thank you all right one more yeah, um, thanks, Michael. As we have to finish this event at 3 p.m., we can take one more question. And give me a second. We will take this question from Thomas Fossar from HSBC. Thomas, go ahead, please. Oh, yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first question will be on the group solvency to uh, sensitivity. I was wondering if you had already quantified the uh, potential benefits of the uh, US uh, back book uh, reinsurance deal. That was the first one. Maybe a second, qu second one I can squeeze it. Oliver, I remind you uh, commenting and maybe complaining a bit on the return on equity of the commercial lines versus retail. Uh, could you potentially indicate how much the gap would have been closed by, 2020, uh, by 2024? Thank you. So uh, I can take the first question. There is no impact in reality on the uh, solvency to sensitivity coming from this transaction because, as you know, we are including Allianz Life with the equivalent, so they are coming to our numbers with uh, the local RBC model, and the local RBC model, the fixing this annuity is not really sensitive to interest rates or credit spread, and there is no equity component, let's put it this way, from a general account point of view. So basically the sensitivity from a group point of view are not uh, uh, affected positively or negatively from, uh, from this transaction. Just the level is affected by 9 percentage point. And is that okay? Where isn't the question, Thomas? Yes, it, it is. Very good. Then I would like to use the last uh, 90 seconds, if I may. Is another one open? There was another one. The ROE. Sorry, the ROE. ROE between commercial. Ah, ROE. Ah, okay. oh, sorry, I didn't get it. was ROE. Couldn't get it. Oh, that's also my question. So there is a difference between the ROE in personal lines and commercial lines. 
on, uh, in uh, Italian personal lines, the ROE is uh, north of 15%, well north of 15% in retails. And in commercial lines, we, are, we need to differentiate a little bit. Uh, we, we are about 12. I think it's a little bit better, but we need to work on the ROE of GCS uh, a little bit. The reason anyway for the different ROE between uh, personal lines and commercial lines is one that the combined ratio tends to be a little bit higher but we see also different capital intensity so between the two lines so uh, but fundamentally think about uh, well north of 15 percent <coughs> on uh, retail and i would say uh, double digit but low double digit in uh, in commercial lines but clearly we will try to get to a little bit of a better outcome in the next three years yeah so that's it we are a little bit over time i would like to uh, use the opportunity to thank you very much for your interest and attendance. I hope it was worth your while because we spent some of a uh, few hours of your time. We were very excited to present our new plan to you. We as a team feel that Allianz is exactly going in the right direction. I'd like to use the opportunity to thank my fellow colleagues here on the speech and in Newport Beach and somewhere else in the off. Uh, and take the opportunity to thank our spectacular team who has prepared and run the show from behind the scenes. You are making Allianz successful. We are just the faces. You are the engine room. Thank you very much. And uh, enjoy the weekend. <laughs>